Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, Guillermo and I chat with Brian Redford and Jeremy Brustel from Risk Zero. We talk about their previous work in cloud and how ZK offered unique solutions to long-standing scaling problems. We cover topics like Risk Five, building VMs, and talk about how Risk Zero aims to build a system that could support a robust, decentralized public cloud. But before we start in, if you haven't yet, be sure to check out the ZK Whiteboard Sessions. It's produced by ZK Hack and powered by Polygon. This is a series of educational videos that will help you get onboarded into the concepts and terms that we talk about all the time on the ZK front. It's a great place to start learning about ZK Tech. We also have a study group going right now focused on the ZK Whiteboard Sessions, so be sure to check that out over on the ZK Hack Discord. Also, keep your eye out for the upcoming ZK Hack 3. We are returning with our virtual multi-week event once again on November 22nd. There will be workshops and puzzle hacking competitions. Keep an eye out on Twitter and in Discord for more information. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Mina Protocol. If you're a developer looking to get hands-on experience building zero-knowledge applications, then you should apply for Mina's ZK App Beta Testers Leaderboard. Participants will get access to test challenges where you can learn to build ZK apps on Mina for a chance to rank on the leaderboard against other participants. And the top participants will have the opportunity to be considered for a grant. Mina's ZK apps are written in TypeScript, so developers can easily get started without learning a custom programming language like other ZK protocols. Learn more about the ZK app beta testers leaderboard and how you can start building ZK apps by heading to minaprotocol.com forward slash ZK podcast. That's minaprotocol.com forward slash ZK podcast. So thanks again, Mina Protocol. Now here's Anna and Guillermo's interview with Risk Zero. Today, Guillermo and I are here with the guys from Risk Zero. Welcome to the show, Brian Redford and Jeremy Brustel. Thanks. Super glad to be here. Yeah, it's wonderful to do this uh, conversation. Cool. A quick note, uh, ZKV and myself personally are investors in Risk Zero. And I guess Bain Capital Crypto is as well. Yeah. Obviously, we are never giving financial advice on these shows. It goes without saying. But uh, we thought we'd just let you know that before we kick off. So to start this off, I think it would be great to meet Brian and Jeremy. Tell us a little bit about your journey to working in ZK and blockchain in general? Blockchain is fairly new for me. Um, my interest in ZK originally uh, comes from the sort of more mathematical side. Um, my background uh, has been in, uh, I mean, I've been interested in computer security and cryptography uh, for as far back as it goes. Um, probably the first notable thing I did was I uh, wrote AirSnort, which was a program that uh, broke web encryption uh, many, many moons ago. If anyone still remembers web, it was the old uh, Wi-Fi protocol thing. Um, and I'm really fundamentally um, interested in sort of following new mathematics and sort of emerging research and trying to figure out where you could potentially commercialize that. Uh, most of my startups historically have all been in that sort of arena where there's some sort of new theoretically interesting thing and then you figure out how to apply it. Um, I've been following ZK for about mm, seven or eight years uh, since I first discovered the uh, PCP theorem about probabilistically checkable proofs. And when I realized that it was possible to check correct execution of programs in constant time, regardless of how long they ran, I was like, wait a second, this like completely changes the landscape in terms of scalability of distributed computing and all of these things, right? Um, but at the time, it was not a practically useful technology, right? Everything was just way too slow. So I continued mm. to follow the research on it. And the way that I do that, because I love math, but I'm not a mathematician. I'm not really great at writing proofs. You know, I'm not an academic. Um, and as a result, the way that I, f I read math is I read the papers and then I try to implement the code. Um, and so I had been, you know, sort of in my, you know, copious spare time between startups and, you know, other uh, things. <laughs> you know, taking a little bit of time to implement some of these uh, ideas from the various uh, papers I was reading. Um, and then, you know, at some point, realized that it was, we were now at the point where 
this stuff was about to become practically useful. At which point, um, you know, I think I started to try to pitch everyone that I knew about this, 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 you know, <laughs> oncoming future of, uh, you know, sort of zero knowledge proofs and how they would change the world. So I think that's when I started to uh, try to talk Brian's ear off about it as well. So cool. What era is this exactly? What uh, time frame? Well, so I think the, 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 when did I start talking to you, Redford? Two years ago. I think this is two years ago. We were on this like road trip to, oh. to, to Oregon. Um, Wait, you yeah. were on a road trip to Oregon? Yeah, well, Intel's offices are down there. So, um, <laughs> oh, got yeah. it, got it, got so it. So there's yeah. this pattern yep. where Jeremy gets uh, gets involved in or interested in things and uh, then starts talking people's ears off about them. And that's actually, <laughs> you know, how we, we started our first startup 20 years ago, which was doing decentralized wireless mesh networking over 802.11a and b. It was, and eventually g, that kind of worked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that company eventually sold to Nokia long after we uh, we ditched it. Um, and then I, I went off and worked at Google for seven years, where I was building out the Google Cloud platforms, pricing, billing, and metering systems, right. um, which actually feeds into my interest in this space. So, uh, yeah. What's the connection there? The connection is that um, inside Google, you would see a lot of projects and products and product managers all trying to figure out features for their cloud products um, and seeing features ship or not ship. And the gating factor was like, can we make 95% margins on it or not? And so I think there's this huge barrier to innovation in this space that, that really comes from the sort of centralized control over what cloud uh, products actually ship and which ones don't. And so, um, you know, after Jeremy convinced me that we could use ZK to, to really, you know, achieve cloud scale decentralized computing, I, I, it was hard to look away. Wow. Well, I want to get into that. I want to get into that vision. Um, is there anything else sort of in the lead up to forming Risk Zero that you think, like you sort of mentioned some companies, some startups? So one thing that's worth noting is me and Redford have known each other for a long, long time. We met through the Seattle sort of hacking scene, um, as well as some of the other folks um, in the company. And we've, we've done multiple startups together. Prior to um, you know this, we worked at a company called uh, Vertex AI, which basically built um, a, a tensor compiler that allowed you to accelerate various AI workflows, especially on different custom chips, which is why we ended up getting acquired by Intel. Um, so I think that the, the thing to note is that we've, we've done multiple companies together. We've known each other for a long, long time. And the, you know, but that we're sort of new to this particular um, realm. Although I've also been following, to be honest, we've been following, you know, the state of um, cryptocurrencies for a long time. I mean, I read Satoshi's paper when it came out. And mm -hmm. my, my thought was, wow, what a brilliant solution to the distributed consensus problem. But it's only going to do four transactions per second ever because <laughs> it doesn't scale. So who would ever use this thing? <laughs> mm. Which was clearly not correct. Um, but, right. you know. Um, when Jeremy, you know, talked to me into doing this company, he's like, really, we're going to do a blockchain company? I mean, I think cryptocurrency is cool. You know, I've used it for various things, at, you know, in the past. But um, uh, was this prime? This is like bear market a little bit. It was like 2020. Is this what we're talking about? Maybe it was bear market. I mean, at the time, yes. But I think by the time we really started talking about making a company, it was it was the hay, the, the bull market. The bull, was really okay. Coming up. Did you? But yeah. did you guys have this sense of like? crypto is like did you have any concerns about like the scams and the things that had made headlines i mean i don't i think i did only from a is this a sustainable business model is this yeah. space going to you know is this going to eventually be something that um doesn't dominate those the sort of headlines in that way but i also think you know i, I bought lots of nfts prior to this my mm -hmm. friend my <laughs> One of my close friends was actually one of the pioneers of AI art and, and was an early sort of NFT person on Tezos. So I always saw the value and I kind of ignored a bit of the hype around or, or like mainstream media dunking on crypto constantly. I mean, it's some kind of an easy target. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was a little worried about it. But I think the more I dug into it, the more I realized that, you know, I think a lot of the most interesting things in computer science are going on in this space right now. Did you think, was it really the ZK part that dragged you in though? Cause like you had known, like you said, Jeremy, you've known, you'd known about blockchain for a long time. Like what was it, what, what's the switch there? 
So, so for me, like I've always loved distributed systems and I've always believed in decentralization. Um, and, you know, I mean, our first company was really a wireless mesh networking company and it used a lot of, it, it was a very heavily focused on decentralizing routing and communications, right? Um, and I always wanted to really love, you know, sort of cryptocurrencies and not so much the currency side, but some of the more interesting things like smart contracts and what you could do with Ethereum. But like, to me, there was always this issue, which is like, if I wanted to build Reddit on top of, you know, one of these systems, it, it, was, it was never feasible, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. there's always this idea that the, the, because they don't scale, if you have a lot of transactions, the cost per transaction just goes up. And, you know, no one's going to pay $50 of gas to upvote on Reddit, right? It's just not reasonable. And so I liked the idea in concept, but it wasn't until sort of this realization that zero knowledge could help pave the way to, you know, I think one of the things we like to say is transactions too cheap to meter, right? This idea that we could actually build really, you know, sort of cloud scale distributed um, systems on top of these that I got really excited about the space. Um, oh. So I, I'd always been interested in it from an intellectual standpoint, but, you know, at that yeah. level. And I think ZK, once we started digging into it, so, you know, I, I think between sort of that road trip and, and Jeremy, like, I mean, I didn't even believe this was possible when he was telling about it. My mind was just blown for like a month. I'm like, somebody's going to figure out something with the math. But then once you dig into the math, you're like, no, this seems like it's not that hard to understand, like at a conceptual level. And it does seem like lots of computer science would be broken if this is broken. So what was the starting point ZK wise? Like, what was the paper or like project that first dragged you in? Do you remember? So, so for me, I mean, I think it was... Well, so originally it was just discovering that the, the, the sort of PCP theorem was in fact true, although not necessarily useful. Uh, but then I think the one that really got me excited initially was the cycles of elliptic curves, which was a, the sort of first recursion in zero knowledge proof systems, because to me, recursion is one of the key components that makes scaling possible. So I actually implemented that whole thing. Um, but the recursion time was like, I don't know, a minute and a half or something mm. on the implementation I had. And I was like, too slow, right? Um, and uh, and I, the implementation was pretty efficient as well. So I, I, I basically continued to follow it in a until the deep fry paper was the first one where I was like, okay, this is starting to get to the point where it's really doable. And I started working on implementations of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think it was what I got to. I got a working recursion for a simpler system than the current proof system we have right now. That was down to fifteen seconds, and I could see how. I could get it down below one second, and then I was like, "Okay, this is this is super cool." Right. This is actually when Jeremy started talking to people about it. He kind of like didn't mention he was doing any of this until he he's like, he's like explains the whole thing. He's like, and also you can verify proofs inside another proof. And I'm like, so when you think about it, and you're like, oh, okay, this has insane implications. Just truly insane. So here's a quick question for you, right? Because like you know, now we're, let's shift maybe a little bit more to zero. But I'm actually curious. It's like a it's like a wild idea, right? Like to me, like when you guys first talk to us, like when you mention it, it's like the obvious thing to do. It's like, hey, we have, we have, we can build circuits, right? What is a thing that is very cool to build with circuits? The whole concept is wild, right? Like you have these circuits now, you can like build things with them, you can prove things with them. And this is like very interesting, kind of theoretically speaking, because like, sure, I can like make a thing that you want to convince me of and like, fine, like you can convince me of it in like this very nice short proof. Okay. But the jump from that to being like, Hey, what is a cool thing we can build with circuits that isn't just like, you know, a calculator or something. It's a processor. Right. And then be like, Oh wait, we can like efficiently verify the entire exist, like, you know, an entire program trace on a specific processor by just like, you know, instead of building the processor, on like an FPGA or like a real circuit, you build it in this like zero knowledge circuit. Like where the hell did that idea come from? Because like at the time, you know, ZK VMs were kind of maybe starting to be a thing, but people hadn't really talked about it. And like, it was known you could do this, but it's kind of a logical leap. So yeah, it was, so I started, I, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was basically because when I tried to explain how one would go about writing a program, no one could understand what the, Earth, I was talking. It was it basically, it was like, oh, an arithmetic circuit. Okay, wait. So it's like a circuit, but it's in a finite field, right? You know, I, I have a lot of friends who are very smart programmer hacker types, right? And 
I, 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 as I tried to explain, oh, it's Turing complete, you can do, you know, everyone was like, that thing sounds impossible to program. Yeah, and I think the, the initial versions too, we were, because our background at like Vertex AI and the company that Intel acquired was building out DSLs for machine learning. So we're like, we'll, we'll just build a DSL and use MLIR to compile these circuits because this is a pattern we know and understand. And I don't know, we hacked on, you hacked on that for a while, but at some point, I think it was I think it might have been Redford who came up with the idea. He's like, well, what if we just use an existing like ISA? And I can't remember because we were all hanging out together. I think it was Redford that actually was the one who came up with that. And then and then basically once that idea popped into our heads, the real question then was, is that actually feasible? And if so, what would be the architecture to use? Right. So we looked mm -hmm. at like WebAssembly, we looked at MIPS, we looked at all kinds of different things. And with the with the the sort of question of how small of a circuit can you build and still run something that's an existing processor? Because you know we did a lot of compiler work. Our previous company was a compiler right. company. And we know how hard compiler tool chains are and how hard language mm. adoption is. And so this idea that you know you would just build an entire functional compiler tool chain and a new language and the whole nine yards and get adoption that's like a huge amount of engineering. On the other hand, if you can build a circuit that um, is able to run something that already exists, then all that upper part of the stack you get for free, right? Mm. I say not just the upper part of the stack too, but the entire ecosystem of libraries and existing work that all the other developers in the world have done over the you know course of time. I was gonna say, we were just talking recently about you know um, this, this sort of example of using, doing image cropping, um, using uh, you know, zero knowledge proofs and um, from you know, Dan Bonet. And one of, the, one of the thoughts was, well, actually inside the you know, risk, you know, zero ZKVM, we could decode a, a GIF and then crop an image and then re-encode it to a JPEG or whatever, because I could just import the, you know, libraries for doing that, um, you know, directly because it's an already existing language, right? Right. I remember like a year ago, like you came up to us and you were like, hey, what if we just like did risk five, you know, like one of the restricted ISAs, sorry, I say what an ISA means, like an instruction set. Uh, instruction set, what does A stand for? Do you architecture. Guys remember? Architecture, it is architecture, okay. Um, you know, it's like, what if we just like did this and then like had all of RISC five, in other words, all of LLVM, which is like this thing that you can, that everything compiles to, including like Rust, C, C++, anything you want. Um, so you can compile everything down to LLVM and then compile LLVM down to like, you know, this like micro, like micro architecture, I guess, this like risk architecture, right? Uh, and then just be like, oh yeah, cool. Like now we just, like can use everything you want on this thing, but also it's zero knowledge because like that's that's like a thing you can just build in zero knowledge. It's just like yet another circuit, right? Um, and I was like, wait, why the hell did no one think of this? This is like insane. Well, Ellie the, actually, yeah, uh, there was a tweet where Ellie, um, who's amazing, and you know we're obviously huge fans of Ellie's um, Ellie Van Sasson, the inventor of Starks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody asked him like, why did you invent Cairo? Why didn't you just you know? Um, use MIPS or something. It's like, oh, well, that's not going to be possible for at least five years or something. So, uh, <laughs> so I think that there's just when you, if you there's this sort of like, you know, if you start building something in a, in a nation space, it's pretty easy to kind of get stuck in thought holes. Mm. So I think we just, you know, we effectively just had a second mover advantage and we we're just kind of already primed to think about the world this way. One of the questions I did have I wanted to ask was about the name Risk Zero. So, Guillermo, you just mentioned Risk Five usually spelt risk V. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I'm guessing it's risk zero knowledge. Is that where yeah, that comes from? Idea. Yeah. It Very was, nice. Uh, was, you know, I'm good at like one thing in life and it's making up really stupid things <laughs> like that. I was, this is a great <laughs> name though. This is like, honestly, like probably one of the best, like, like just, it's just Nerd like such a good titles? reference. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's <laughs> really good. It's like, it's perfect. And like people are like, it's quite polarizing. It's quite polarizing. Really? Early, no way. Yeah. The, the one of the earliest people I pitched on it was our product manager from Intel, and he was like, "That is the stupidest name you have to change." It. Ooh. <laughs> okay, and wait, you just defined risk v risk five, mm -hmm. but I actually don't know anything about this. So oh, can we yeah, Jeremy, actually wanna... say what that it's, is? That's actually it's it's why we, talk about why we chose it, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically, risk stands for reduced instruction set computing, mm -hmm. and this is this idea, um, you know, 
uh, early microprocessors, uh, there was a question of should you make the instructions for the processor complex and do lots of things, or should you try to boil them down to the smallest possible set of instructions, the most simple way to represent a program. Um, you end up having to run more instructions, but the processor becomes much simpler to build. You can run it at higher clock speeds. And your compiler has to be smarter. Right. So so it's basically that that's risk five is a very modern um, new risk instruction set that's learned from all of the previous ones. And so it's like super minimal and very capable and well designed. Um, and so when we looked at it, it was definitely by far the sort of easiest of the existing instruction sets or VMs out there that we could implement, right? right. You know. Yeah. And it also has no IP encumbrances. So x86 is the most notorious CISC or complicated or complex. I'm not even sure what the C stands for anymore. So, you know, implementing x86 would probably be harder than building a ZK EVM. Um, maybe, maybe not. Jeremy would know. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, then if you're if you're not doing that, you're basically looking at, you know, ARM or MIPS. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other ones that maybe you could think about. But um, ARM, ARM, is, ARM has IP encumbrance, and MIPS used to until very recently, but mm -hmm. also is a bit more complex. But RISC-V also comes with a bunch of bonus features. Mm. Um, in addition to being open source, it has a complete battery of conformance tests. So we know that our processor implements risk, the RISC-V specification because, well, at least insofar as the tests capture that. But on top of that, they actually have a formally, uh, formal model for, for what the risk five chips look like. So in the kind of formal methods work we're doing, at some point we'll be able to, you know, really speak very confidently about the, the nature of the system that we're building. What exactly now are you building then? Like, are you building a ZK VM where you can run something like risk on it? I don't know if that's how you're supposed to say that at all, or is it is that That's exactly correct? what happens, yeah. Okay. So like if, if, you, if a programmer writes, you know, like, uh, Sudoku game or uh, uh, Mao, the card game. I know some people trying to do that in, in, in Rust or something and just compiles it, then it runs on top of this VM, just like a ZK EVM might run Solidity bytecode. Mm -hmm. um, this runs RISC-V code. So any, so we support C++ and, and Rust. The compiler compiles this down into Risk the RISC-V ISA, and then this runs um, inside this VM. It's really like having a little like Arduino or microcontroller that's like, attached and living inside your system, but it's virtual and it can't lie about what it does. Yeah. And it also you don't, it still has the same kind of ZK properties where you can hide inputs uh, and so forth, as well as hide the program. You can know, you can just commit to this functional commitment idea. You can commit to knowing the hash of a program that produces uh, uh, mm -hmm. or acts in a certain way. Yeah. You just, you've sort of flipped, as you're describing it, you flipped a little bit between the ZK VM, ZK EVM. Um, this is a ZK VM. Right. This is not for Solidity. All those languages you mentioned are not Solidity. So do you still see yourself a little bit in the camp of the ZK EVM slash ZK VM teams? Because there's a lot of groups yeah. that are trying to do something like this. So there are two ways you could think about. Um, obviously, you know, the Ethereum ecosystem and developer community, especially since I've gotten involved in the space, just blows me away. The, yeah. The, the events and and all of the people uh, just building in the space. So you know we're by no means uh, trying to detract from that ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of ways in which you know risk the risk zero actually uh, can contribute to that ecosystem. So it is possible to compile Solidity code to LLVM. We haven't played with that very much, mm -hmm. just because you know um, time. But another thing you can do is run the EVM on top of risk zero. Oh. So you can actually compile. Well, not, you can't do compile geth yet because our Go supports <laughs> like. Well, the Go support will be fu fully functional in a bit, but um, you know, one thing at a time. Um, but there's also Rust implementations of the EVM, and that you can compile, and you can actually, so you can run Ethereum programs on uh, a EVM running on top of Risk Five. So mm. you know you can the, a nice thing about having a general purpose processor architecture like this as your base ZK proving system is that you can in fact run other VMs on top of it. Um, there's actually people, and you know they haven't told me exactly why they're doing this, but running an x86 emulator on top of Risk Five and then proving the results of Linux kernel boot ups on x86. <laughs> it has something to do with gold bars. Um, that's all I can say. <laughs> Wait, 
what is the what? point of this? Sorry, I'm like. I, the, the, the person hasn't told us exactly. It has something to do with like physical asset tracking and sensors associated with that at logistic points and stuff like that. I see a lot of applications for this, honestly. But that's wait, but I'm, I'm surprised like a lot of sensors just like fully just have Linux instead of using some like real time operating system that's really I small. I, yeah, he did not get into the specifics. <laughs> okay, well. That's fair. Fine. All right. Um, Do you like in the ZK part of the ZK VMs? Are you talking about privacy or are you mostly fo focused on the scaling quality? We, we absolutely care about privacy. Um, and uh, I would say that both are very important to us. Um, in terms, so so we are we do fully support zero knowledge, um, and we support both zero knowledge of the um, execution of the program, as well as uh, we can even make it such that you can prove you ran the program you said you were going to run, but without revealing the details of the program. The use cases for that are a little more obscure. Hmm. I mean, I think if you look at the core technology, it's a you know the idea that you can build systems with the risk with the risk zero VM that do so like enhance privacy and you know enhance scaling. I'd say as a company, we're initially focused on the scaling aspects. So when we were ideating on what to do as the company, we spent went into deep deep zk identity kind of rabbit holes because I think mm. this is the the use cases that most excite me about this space have to do with pseudonymous uh, identity and the ability to ZK, you know, basically do ZK attestations and yeah. sort of um, reputation scores and all of this stuff. Cool. Um, but it, fundamentally, I think if the infrastructure is not there, it seems like these, you know, having an amazing ZK identity system when you can't really build, uh, you know, a sufficiently complicated application ecosystem seems kind of pointless. So we're mm. focused on scaling because I think that's sort of the where the um, biggest need I think is at right now. Yeah, I mean, it's table stakes, basically, right? Like, I, if I want a distributed Reddit that, uh, that has ZK, I can do all kinds of cool things with the identity, but if I can't actually build the system in the first place, it's sort of not relevant. So here's a quick question. Uh, I think we discussed this prior, but, um, you know, risk five or any architecture, does not often have, like, a notion of here is private data and here is public data, right? And we're talking about privacy here. So like, how do you enforce like, you know, what data is public and what data, like if you're just compiling a C program down, right? Like the C program itself has no notion of here are my variables that I will not reveal to you, right? Mm -hmm. Like it has the notion of like, here are variables that you should not access, but there, there's no notion of like privacy in like C or Rust or whatever, right? Yeah. So, so we model that via library calls. So effectively, um, the way that it works is the ZKVM begins execution and there are sort of um, calls you can make to request data from the, so we call, we call the VM the guest and we call the computer running the proof the host. So okay. um, the guest can act, ask the host for information, which is always presumed to be private. The guest can do any kind of computation it wants. All of that is presumed to be private. There's a specific... Um, API for writing to the public record. And anything you don't write to the public record is private. So, um, you know, typically what you want to do is you, you want your ZKP to attest to some fact about something. And so, so whatever you want to attest to, you write that to the, the public record. Um, and that's the only thing that's public. Everything else is private. So that's kind of how that, we And whatever that. you commit to up front, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, and what does a program look like, right? So like usually in processors like a program is well in like real processors not this like weird thing where we have a bunch of like virtual you know things with the kernel right you have like here's what happens you have like a chunk of memory that is a program right and that's like you compile it down you then like write it to memory and then you say processor start at 0x0400000 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, go and then it starts like reading instructions from memory and going up but like you know, what is like, do you have a notion of memory? Like how does it like, maybe it's getting a little bit too into the weeds, but I'm just like very curious about this specific it, thing. It works exactly like that. There is exactly okay. um, a processor. There is a representation of RAM. We actually use uh, a permutation argument uh, mechanism to do the emulation of the, the random access memory. Um, and yeah, it looks exactly like a regular processor. We actually, so, so when you compile the program down, we actually compile it to an ELF, which is a type oh, of uh, nice. 
it's a it's a loadable object file for um, you know operating systems. And basically, we load the program into uh, memory at the dawn. So so when the when the VM the zkVM begins execution, it, the first thing it does is it loads the program code into memory, um, and then it jumps to the start address, and then it runs just like a normal program on a normal processor, um, and uh, and then it when it terminates, uh, there's just basically we use an e call, which is like a um, low level instruction in Risk Five to call to the operating system to represent the termination of the program, and uh, that's pretty much it. So it actually it fully emulates all the things like you would expect. Um, and when you write a program, you know, it jumps into main and has, there's some initial setup and all the sort of exact standard stuff. I was going to ask one more question, which is, um, like, what does, mem here, here is like, and this is a question that a bunch of teams grapple with, but, you know, how do you abstract memory in like a ZK sense? This is like, it's a weird question, right? Like, what, yeah. what does it mean to like load a file into like this ZK circuit? And then be like, cool, all right, go. So uh, the current implementation, you know, we just represent memory as a bunch of 32-bit numbers that live at well-defined addresses. Um, that's sort of the word size that the processor likes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, you can load a byte instead of a word if you want to, but that's all just sort of handled by the VM. Um, and the, pr the initial program state, we actually encode into sort of a Merkle uh, representation from the ELF file. So effectively, the, the initial memory image is determined by that sort of Merkleized data structure. Uh, so then there's a special mechanism for talking to the host using non-determinism. So there's basically this mechanism by which the guest can request data from the host and point the host to a particular memory address, at which point data just sort of magically appears in that memory. Mm. Um, which is allowable because one of the things we do with our memory semantics is we define memory which has never been read or written to as being allowed to have arbitrary data. And so as long as you tell the host to put it in some place in memory that you haven't ever looked at before, which we handle via the library calls and sort of the underlying sort of operating system level of the ZKVM, um, then when, the, when you ask for the host to put something there, you can, it, it, can, it can appear. Of course, you need to verify that it's right, right? So, so on top of this, we're basically building a set of you know, mechanisms for allowing sort of, um, you know, sort of Merkleized access to data structures. And we're, we're looking at building sort of like an IDL around that to help make it easier for programmers to manage and stuff. Um, I, I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a, I'm going into a couple of different things because the question's kind of broad, so. It is, sorry, I apologize, but just like even thinking about it, right, like the idea that like you have a processor that lives in, you know, inside of your processor, fine. Let's say like ZKEVM and ZKVMs in general have thought about this, but what I've never seen before, and this is like fucking wild, to me at least, is like this idea that you could just like, you know, have undetermined data at the time you're executing Except like the one time you're, you know, like you're executing this like very long, complicated program, right? A bunch of stuff is happening. And then you're like, crap, I need to go read like this thing. But this thing is not defined while I am ex like at the time that I am going to like read it, this thing is not defined. So what do I do? I can just like ask, you know, this is like the little computer living inside your big computer, right? The little computer is like, I don't know what this thing is. So please, big computer, you know, your laptop or whatever, tell me, please, what, like, should this thing be, right? I will pause execution until you're like, tell me what this thing is. And then you just, like, go and insert it, and then it just continues happily as if, like, yeah. everything was cool the entire time. But it's, like, wild, right? Yes, although you're not guaranteed that, like, anything that happens on the host side is going to produce something, a proof that's interesting Reasonable. to talk about. Of course. Right? Which is why we get into these kind of Merkleized data structures. Like, if, you know, if you call out to the host and it just accesses a random URL and dumps data back from it, then you can't really speak about what the characteristics of that are. That's right. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. But it, it does allow you to do sort of the check and verify, right? If I want to do a square root, mm -hmm. I can always ask the host, hey, please put the square root of this number here. And then inside the ZKVM, I can take that number and I can square it and make sure it matches the thing I'm expecting it to be. So, we, you know, ZKVM systems use this sort of non-deterministic trick a lot, um, but in our case, it's a particularly yeah. easy. 
like, please fetch this uh, content addressable storage that hashes to X or whatever, you know? Exactly. You and then ver you can verify like, that it actually hashes to that. So that's right. That's right. That's right. So like you use this trick a lot, like in ZK proofs, but this is like a very nice and transparent way of doing it, right? Like when you create a ZK proof of, of like a statement, you have to know what the values of that statement are. But like here, it's like a very like transparent way of doing that, right? It's like, oh no, like, I don't know what this is. Please like, let me just like go fetch that from like the big computer that I exist in. And then like the big computer is like, here you go. You know, it's like God handing you down and you're just like, I will just check you just to be sure, but that's okay. Exactly. Right. It's interesting because in some ways it inverts the sort of notion of, you know, if you look at, you're running some program in Linux and then you want to call into the operating system, you fundamentally, the operating system is more trusted than the, you know, sort of mm -hmm. program running. In this case, it's kind of like the opposite. It's like there is an operating system. You can call out to the operating system. It'll hand you data back, but then you better check it because actually the trusted part is the, the program that's running. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of an interesting inversion in that regard. So a lot of the ZK VMs that we've been learning about use Starks or they use Fry and snarks somehow like they'll do like a recursion step using something that starks actually uses as well but why are most of the zk vms using at the very least parts of starks or actually using full starks under the hood so, so largely it's because starks are particularly efficient at proving um, circuits who have a repeated structure and in this mm -hmm. case the repeated structure is time so the idea is is that um, uh, you know, a, a job of a VM is there's the state of the processor at time t, and then it computes the next state at time t plus one and time t plus two. It's basically executing the same function, if you will, over and over again, stepping time forward. And Starks are really well suited for that. Uh, the error representation, you know, has this already built-in notion of um, that. And, and it, so it's a perfect match, right, um, for a sort of something that wants to look like a digital circuit running over time. So this is the error features. So this is different from R1CS in other kinds of snarks. Air, arithmetic intermediate representation. You gave me that definition before. I did not actually <laughs> memorize it myself. And I, I, I sort of, I have a visual of this, that it's like time-based rounds kind of, like it's going equal time. But why do you need that exactly? Well, so if you think about it, it's interesting that the, the analogy between a you know, actual digital processor and these sort of arithmetic circuits is really strong, right? Mm. Um, they both, like, you know, if you look at a digital circuit, you've got wires and then you have, like, gates. And in an arithmetic circuit, you have numbers and you have these operations like multiplies, for example. And in a real um, digital circuit, there's this idea of clock cycles and combinational logic. So you've got this combinational logic, which is just like a feed-forward circuit. Some inputs come in and it processes through and then later some outputs come out. But in a real processor, you don't just use combination logic. You also have these little memory cells that when a clock cycle comes in, stuff goes from through that combination logic, lands back in memory cells, and then it gets stored there. And then the next clock cycle comes in, and that same process repeats. And so the process that's happening inside of, you know, say, your Intel processor or whatever is this basically this process where every clock cycle, there's a current state, and it then computes the new state, and then the clock cycle ends, and then the next one comes around. And that exact structure is the way that a Stark is structured. So if you're looking at something that wants to sort of execute steps over time, um, it's a really perfect analogy. And in fact, actually, one could literally transliterate the design of an actual gate-level RISC-V processor over into a Stark. If you were to do that in the naive way, it would run horrifically slowly, but the model is actually strong enough that you could almost lift the the direct implementation. Yeah, I kind of wonder if that's why Ellie like invented them in the way he, he did. I, don't, I guess I've never asked, asked him that, but mm -hmm. you know, it might have been very intentional on, on his part to build something that is more amenable to creating a VM, you know, given that Cairo was, you know, one of the first kind of VMs of this kind. Mm. This is maybe a bit of a dumb question, but like, what, you know, we talked about the ZKVM as the environment where you would then deploy Risk Five. Why does it need to be in a ZKVM? Why couldn't you do that straight on a NL1? Like on Ethereum? I mean, on Ethereum, maybe it's because it doesn't allow for certain opcodes or I don't know, but like, could you, could you not just have this as a standalone blockchain? Oh, uh, yeah, you could. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what we're working on. 
Yeah. Okay, and actually yeah. you are. So actually, <laughs> that's that's so funny. Another question then, because like ZK VMs and ZK EVMs, pretty much every time we talk about this, it's always in the context of like them living on another blockchain as a roll up, kind of yes. still using shared security. But in your case, you don't need to. I think the thing that's important to note is we are very much interested in the L1 space and making an L1. But part of the reason is the fundamental reason that these systems don't scale has to do with the way that consensus itself works, right? Um, and that if you re-look at and re-examine the question of how do you build a consensus system, how do you build, how do you build an L1 with the knowledge that ZK exists, it changes the set of tools you can have. So one of our goals as a company is to sort of say, okay, if you start over and you say, what can you do? What can you build in terms of a consensus mechanism knowing that you have this capacity to do zero knowledge proofs? Um, where does that get you? In fact, the, one, one real quick analogy. So why do L1s not scale very well? And it's very simple actually. You know, If someone wants to run a computation, no one can believe that computation was right without running it themselves. And as a result, every machine in the network has to run every single transaction, right? Mm. Um, and yeah. with ZK, that that assumption is different. The The trust that can exist between two parties is fundamentally different. Um, so one person can run the code and someone else can check it. And the process of checking it is much smaller than the work of running it. And you can use that as a building block to help make systems scale. Hmm. I mean, there are examples of that already in the wild, like Mina is a recursive snark. P.S. I'm an advisor to them, so just, just <laughs> declaring everything. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I I'm just wondering, like, I guess, like in your consensus, in the consensus part, are there is there zk in there as well? Like, are you using that recursive technique as well? Yes. Okay. Is that the part that is the ZK of the ZK VM or is there like double layers? Like there's a Z, there's ZK and consensus and then there's ZK somewhere else. Uh, so there's, we use the same ZK VM both for consensus and for the execution environment for user programs. And in fact, the, I guess the way things are shaping up and Jeremy could talk about this a bit more, you know, sort of ZK predicates are kind of a key part of how we actually like agree on the next state of the world. So yeah, I was gonna ask like, um, because this is like somewhat recursive, right? Like, what are you doing? Are you just like programming a verifier on top of like your risk five processor that then verifies like the computation? So like, you're just like using the, it's like, this feels like a bit of an Ouroboros, like <laughs> I am using my platform to both like do the computation, you know, make us think proof of the computation. And also mind you, I'm also gonna verify it on this ZK, like, you know, whatever the ZKVM, right? Mm. As like part of the thing. And then like now use that as like my like, fully succinct, like small proof that I just like make yeah. sure everyone knows to start from Genesis to now or something. Is that the idea? Uh, so, so currently, just to be clear, the, um, the existing open source version that is already released already works. You know, you can run full zero knowledge proofs on real programs inside the mm -hmm. ZK, you know, uh, VM. We're currently working on adding support for recursion. I mean, that's not currently released. Uh, but that said, okay. we do have a, a sort of prototype working, and literally our recursion actually runs our normal Rust verifier inside the zkVM to do the verification of the zero knowledge proofs. Right. What's the like abstraction that you use for recursion? Because recursion is kind of a weird thing that like you don't really do on normal processors. I mean, it's very similar to Mina. You just you call you know in, from inside uh, the guest you call the verify function it's just like you would in like snarky js you're like doing a proof and you have a proof as an input and you call verify on it and now you or if you call verify on two proofs you've now created one proof that verifies two proofs but like you also need this to be like incremental right you don't just like because you don't reprove the entire but but, like... but if you think about it, like one can verify the proof that the that block n derives all the way from the genesis block so i can verify the that proof that i got from somewhere else outside the got it, system. Got it, got and it. then I can add another transaction and that combination of those two things proving the, the history to, to point n and then adding n to n plus one, that new proof now proves zero to you know n plus one. I think you've sort of answered that earlier question too, like why would a ZKVM be a better environment than something like Ethereum? to deploy risk zero, right? Because like what it sounds like is that that zero knowledge proving 
proof thing is it's all intertwined and you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that with like a vanilla yeah you could certainly like verify a risk zero proof on ethereum it'd probably be reasonably expensive i think we talked uh, a bit about this certainly but um you could build an l2 a risk zero l2 on ethereum i think it just doesn't necessarily i don't think you're ever going to get then this kind of native scaling enhancement that we're really hoping to see yeah one of the mm -hmm. one of the cool things is that if you are looking at it because of the fact that i can verify two proofs in one proof, I can then do that two layers and I can do verify four proofs or eight proofs or 16 proofs and, you know, powers of two. As a result, our goal is to basically be able to literally process billions of transactions per second, right? Our, our idea is to, we, we, we sort of had this idea, like we're not kidding about being able to make transactions too cheap to meter the idea of being able to just really make the scale of um you know sort of these consensus systems massively larger than it is mm. i mean they'll still probably be metered but you know effectively <laughs> 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 yeah, you unfortunately for like you the miners really don't want to make money. that idea i mean it's it's interesting to hear your story of like where you were coming from the problems you were working on and then seeing zk as the solution to that you sort of mentioned this like infinitely scalable cloud infrastructure, maybe not infinite, but like more than now. Are you still working on that as the vision? Is that the end goal? Or are there like other use cases that have sort of come up? So, I mean, I think when, when you're talking about building an L1, you know, you obviously want to support all of these sort of existing use cases for blockchains. So, mm -hmm. you know, DeFi, gaming, NFTs, token transfers, all of this kind of stuff. But additionally, you know, we want to support, and you see a lot of people trying to do this in the EVM ecosystem as well as like building things that look like uh, SQL databases and uh, other kind of, um, you know, developer tooling that actually makes it possible to write more complicated applications more quickly. So we're still f like the intent of this chain is to enable people to also build effectively cloud services. And we'll actually be, be we're actually building one on top of our L1 that that will eventually release uh that basically lets you prove any arbitrarily complex computation cool. very quickly using massively parallel gpu acceleration proofs but we sort of sometimes talk about ourselves as like instead of being web 3 we talk about it as cloud 2.0 i mean i mean we really do absolutely <laughs> want to construct a decentralized um you know um public cloud you know write something that uh you could run real, you could build like, you could build a social media, you know, um, system on, or you could build, you know, real end user applications that are, are scale, you know. Where cloud usually you like relied on these like international database, like databases kind of all over the world, everything would be very, very fast. Mm -hmm. In this case, are you like actually imagining every person's, every like node runner's machine or miner validator, whatever it is, they are the data center? Yes. Effectively, okay. yeah. So we're actually talking to a bunch of uh, ex-Ethereum miners about utilizing their Ooh. GPUs because we have a GPU accelerated um, backend for this, which is a key kind of key to achieving the sub multi millisecond recursion times uh, that we'll hopefully eventually get to, which really is kind of the, the you know, linchpin or hinge for uh, for for scaling. So yeah, we're, we're talking to, and if you know anybody out there that's GPUs, you want to use them for something, you know, let us you're not proof of stake then? You're going to remain proof of work or are you like a hybrid? We still haven't fully decided, um, but our current notion is this thing we call sort of proof of transaction, which is a little bit like proof of necessary work. But the, mm. the idea being that it will be proof of work like, except that the work being done is literally ZK running zero proof. knowledge yeah, yeah. proofs. Okay. And so as you add more energy to the system, you get more transaction rate. So um, the the idea being a way to make use of all of that work being done to actually help end users get what they want done. Um, although certainly we could absolutely build a proof of stake mechanism as the sort of final decision about which blocks are considered correct as well. From the so, so from the security perspective, we could choose either. But mm -hmm. regardless, there's going to be a fair amount of compute work being done just running the ZKPs themselves. That's fascinating, yeah. And ZKPs have this neat property for a system like that, where you can determine longest chain, not necessarily by number of transactions, but by actual overall amount of computation represented in it. So as you roll up all these ZK proofs, you know exactly how many cycles sort of went into mm -hmm. every leaf or branch of your tree. 
I actually, we did years ago, we did an episode, a full episode on proof of necessary work with Aki Katis. So I'll link to that if people want to understand a little bit more about the features, characteristics of this proof of necessary work or proof of useful work. I, the name has changed a couple of times, but yeah, it's interesting. Uh, on the topic of, um, I guess, scaling, first things first is, you know, you're talking about a processor that lives inside of a real processor. So you can talk about something weird, like how many megahertz you're like it does it you know does it actually run at like how many cycles per second how many instructions per yep. second can it actually do and so here's so now I, this this is a very concrete thing that i can ask how many uh, cycles per second does your current tiny processor run at inside of like a you know normal let's say a normal cpu and then it, you, i heard you said you had a gpu prover so i'm also curious about those numbers yeah so so currently on my mac um what what mac is it uh, I guess it's the new, um, M1. new M1. Uh, <laughs> Mac. Um, yeah, new, new, okay. No, just tell like, all the hackers. New M1 Pro. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. So, so on my, on, uh, so currently on my, on my M1 Pro, um, I get about 30,000 cycles per second, um, okay. uh, for execution. Now, um, sort of with the versions we're working on, we anticipate that I, I'll actually, we actually support currently on our GPU acceleration, which is not released. We support Metal, which is uh, mm -hmm. Mac OS's mm -hmm. acceleration framework, um, as well as CUDA. Um, and we're looking at more like on the one megahertz, so about a million. Um, oh, nice. Per okay. Second. I um, wait, Metal actually does uh, like large field arithmetic, or do you have to do like some weird? We Sorry, made this it is into the weeds. Uh, field arithmetic. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> so, so I, one I, thing to note, by the way, is that our background, our previous company was almost entirely focused on yes. um, acceleration of ML workflows across multiple systems, including you know GPUs, CPUs, custom accelerators, right? So we have a a large background in terms of how to make uh, GPUs um, uh, do interesting and unusual sing and things. dance. If we want to, if we want to say it uh, that way, yeah. Okay, and then so okay, so fine. That's that's a uh, Apple uh, M1 Pro, you know, using Accelerate uh, framework or Metal or whatever you'd like. Uh, what about a you know a cool new, hot off the press? Well, actually, not so hot off the press anymore, but 3090 or something like that. Like a you know like a big GPU. Do you you have any ideas on those numbers? Uh, probably on the order of you know about. 10 million instructions per second. Although okay. uh, we haven't, uh, we don't have the full full numbers on that yet, but. So we're like getting to like you know nineteen seventies nineteen eighties. I feel, oh, no, I feel that's, like that's like ninety like speed. Uh, well, I guess I guess I guess see. I mean, you should be able to run Doom on it. Is the key thing. Um, that, yeah, probably. yeah. No, I, I was that was exactly the question I was going to go for. Is like, what do you think we'll be able to run Doom in ZK? You know. Uh, but well, so an interesting point about all of this too yeah. is that um, you know the the ZK the workload's split up into two parts. One's like running the program forward and creating the sort of tape that you then prove, and the other part's proving it. Yes. And the proof, the proving it part can actually be split up and done in parallel. Right. I mean, you're exploiting this already in like when you're doing it on the GPU, right? Like that's- Effectively, yes. yes. And, and, and we, we should be able to go wider. So in theory, one ought to be able to sort of run the sort of tape generation as uh, Redford describes it. Um, and then split the work out across a farm of GPUs or what have you. Um, and so you should, in terms of latency to actually generate a proof of a fairly large computation, we should be able to get it down. I mean, one of my goals with our work on recursion and acceleration is to be able to ru do things like running, um, you know, a full version of a compiler like GCC or something inside of the proof system <laughs> and be able to generate a zero knowledge proof that in fact, this source code compiles to this binary, right? Like real- There are a lot of real world use cases for this. That's, that's really? like, uh, in terms of, yeah, absolutely. Securing supply chain stuff, like, you know, making sure that binaries that exist and things that are running on systems, being able to ask them to periodically prove that they're using uh, you know, binaries that were verifiably generated from source code that you uh, audited. So, like, how long it'll take those use cases to actually trickle down into the real world? Who knows? But like, couldn't I just like prove that about like a binary that I'm not currently using? So there are there are, yeah things get complicated if you're not doing this for every single computation. If the binary itself that you make is run inside of a ZKP system as well. Oh, then... okay, yeah, sure, fine. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, we like saying. recursively yes. you do have, you do have like occasionally. Yes. 
<laughs> right. If we say within the sandbox, then you can, of course, always prove everything. That's, that's yeah. the very so when, nice well, part. No, but, but when people start talking about ZK hardware, you know, I'm kind of like bearish on it in the short term. But long term, you know, I think somebody's asking us, you know, could you use Risk Zero to make sure that like F-35 fighter jets are like running the safe software they're supposed to be or something? Like, yes, <laughs> hypothetically, uh -oh. but not right now, probably. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I, I'll ask the basic question, and then you can you can uh, you can tell me the, the detail. So, okay, so fine. You know, now we have like fancy schmancy like thirty nineties, and and you can run it not just in one thirty ninety. In fact, you can run it like arbitrarily wide because we know like zk proving is nice and maybe not arbitrarily, but pretty damn close, right? It's pretty parallelizable. So the next natural question is, okay, uh, how about you know what are your thoughts on like maybe using it using FPGAs or using like you know. Like very specific, like ideally at some point in the future, once everything is very standardized, ASICs. But you know, what are what are your ideas behind like hardware acceleration of CK proving? So I, I currently think that the math is like unsettled enough, and um, and that ASICs are uh, hard to hard to make, take a long time, and mm. it's also <laughs> very hard to get access to the latest memory process node technology and so forth. So I think it's going to be a long time before ASICs are competitive. FPGAs, at least for Starks, you know, I don't know, Jeremy probably can answer this like more precisely than me, but I, th I honestly think GPUs are probably going to be um, very salient for quite a while. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, effectively, a lot of the stuff is memory bandwidth. Um, mm -hmm. limited and you know it's really hard to beat the memory bandwidth of um, a 3090 right um, so I think that long term we may see more uh, sort of acceleration but yes I agree I think that it's a little early or for like very specific snark kind of circuits if you see certain use cases evolve where people want certain things done very quickly maybe you'll start to see ASICs for those but um, yeah but I think another uh, aspect of sort of acceleration and we talk about accelerators there's like accelerating the proving system and then there's mm -hmm. also um, accelerating operations you're running on the proving system so when it comes to like doing recursion for instance like right now if you try to just run the verifier, the pure Rust verifier on top of our source code, um, it takes a very, very long time. In fact, on the open source version, you run out of available cycles before you can actually complete a recursion. Um, but we also have an architecture for building accelerator circuits. So if you think about like the a chip in your laptop, you have a GPU, but you also have like cryptography accelerators, you have networking accelerators. There's like really like about a hundred different chips on a sort of modern mm -hmm. microprocessor. So we have an ability to also sort of build these acceleration circuits. Um, and Jeremy can kind of talk about which acceleration circuits we have yeah. and their role in recursion. So, so in our current in our current system, for example, um, that's uh, available. We currently have an accelerator for SHA-256 in particular um, because people need a good fast hashing function. Mm -hmm. And yes, absolutely, you could write SHA-256 on normal RISC V, um, you know, machine code, and it would do all right. But you can do much much faster if you write a specific circuit that does that specific thing. So um, in the sort of next version of stuff, we're going to have additionally a finite field accelerator, which is particularly relevant for recursion. Mm -hmm. um, we are also considering adding a big int uh, modulus multiply accelerator, which should enable a large number of um, sort of elliptic curve kinds of use cases to be run efficiently. Um, and, you know, we're continuing and some also some additional, um, you know, hashing functions. I mean, effectively, if you think about, you know, if you want to build something, if you wanted to say run, you know, geth on top of the risk five ZKVM, um, then you know much of it would actually run just fine. But some of the you know heavy cryptographic components take a lot of cycles, and so if we can if we can move those into accelerators, um, then that's a, a much better way to go. I just want to make a quick clarification because when you're talking about because because we kind of circled into hardware and then out. When you're saying accelerator circuits, you're talking about virtual circuits still, right? Like this Correct. is not yes, in. Very much so. Okay. That's right. What are they? Are they just like libraries? What are they? So so basically, we have this Risk Five circuit, uh, which represents the computation of a normal Risk Five processor, um, and we can just put sort of next to that in the arithmetic. You know, circuit representation, another circuit that does say SHA-256, and then based on sort of what cycle we're running and what the RISC-V says, we have this way of the, for those two circuits to interact. 
Um, in our current mechanism, they actually interact through memory. So the you know, RISC-V processor writes to certain regions of memory and then kicks off the SHA accelerator, which then reads that memory and writes something else and then goes back. Um, in the new system, we're actually going to uh, model it as calls out to the operating system like you would uh, you know, in, the, in a normal computer. If you're running code, you can call up to Linux to say write to a file. So instead, we're going to uh, attach the accelerators in that sort of a method. Um, but yeah, it's basically an extension to the core circuit itself. Interesting. Yeah, that we yeah when we sort of build these in a circom, well, it's not ex exactly like circom. It's quite different. But we have our own sort of circuit description language that hopefully we'll release someday once it's a bit more mature. Um, that we use to kind of describe both the risk five circuit as well as all of these accelerators. Is this a proper DSL or is this like a different it, thing? It will be. Oh, it will be. Okay. And and like, can you write? So let's say I wanted to write like an accelerator for like. I don't know, matrix multiplies, because I think that's really cool and kind of mm -hmm. know what I do. Can I just like go ahead and be like, is it, is it a standard call? I guess is the question. Like, do I need to go and like actually change the, you know, the risk zero source code? Or can I, you know, can I just like call it as if it was like a cool little module or like a, just like a generic? Right. If you wanted to write like blast library, you'd probably have to like hook your blast. You'd probably have to redo your blast backend or something like that to call out to your accelerator. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but let, let's say I can do that. Let's say I, I like, Hit, you know, I I like edit the blast library so like every time it does you know whatever any of the like blast mm -hmm. level one operations it calls my cute little chip instead. Mm -hmm. Can I just like well first things first? So would I write this chip in like circom or you like your DSL and like compile it down to some, like some like specific set of like whatever arithmetic circuits which like I can then use and then like hook into and I can just do this like anyone can just do this or is it just like. Well, currently we haven't released the circuit compiler, sure. um, but once that, at some point, it would be a reasonable use case. Now, what's worth noting is that you need to compile it into the circuit. Right. So basically, when you run a given program, you're either running the program on the sort of stock, you know, RISC-V circuit that has, you know, say a, a RISC-V chip and accelerator A and B, or you could run it on yours that has some additional accelerator. So you, we, at some point, we imagine that people will want to run different programs on sort of different hardware SKUs, if you mm -hmm. will. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea that like the proof system will support <laughs> this idea and you'll be like, oh, I, want, I, I, need, the, I need this, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> Okay. I, I like the idea of a hardware SKU for like a fake processor that is like a zero knowledge chip living inside your machine. It's just like, it just all really comes back to like a very weird like mental image that like doesn't really make any sense, but I love, like, I just love it. It's great. You know, in some ways, one of our sort of goals is to make these systems approachable to programmers that previously knew nothing about zero knowledge proof systems. And I think that this model of the ZKVM as just, a, you know, a little VM, a little virtual machine that works a lot like any other virtual machine. You know, you cross compile your code, you run it in it, it can talk to the host through some kind of communication channel, um, you know, really opens it up to, I think, a wider audience, right? Um, and you don't have to learn a new language or even what an arithmetic circuit is, right? You just think that there's this little, like, it's kind of like a little, you know, Arduino sitting next <laughs> inside your computer. I have one last sort of point I want to cover, and that's, so we talked about Risk Zero living as an L1. Is it going to be connected to any other network or network cluster? Like, I'm talking ecosystem, Ethereum, Polkadot, Cosmos, like anything like that. Almost certainly, however, the likely partners are going to do that. So, you know, don't want to disclose things that aren't signed yet, but Ooh. we have a couple of partnership deals okay. um, yeah, in the works and people are very much actively looking into doing that and we're, we're going to actively support them doing that. Yeah. So we, we see this technology as, you know, being broadly useful and, and while we certainly have our take on what we think the L1 is going to, you know, provide and, and be useful for, I think we also want, you know, this technology to be available to other ecosystems. Yeah. Do you imagine the connection point just being bridges or are you able to connect in a different way to these networks? Yeah, that's like... Um, also TBD the... or can't reveal? <laughs> <or what>? TBD <laughs> and also, also going to take a couple different forms. You know, okay. this is how our L1 will talk to them and then also just how the technology will get used mm. um, by these other systems. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, there's there's sort of a multitude of different parts of integration like so if you just look at ethereum for example um, one could run an ethereum evm in on top of our vm but one also could have a verifier for our proof system that runs on existing ethereum yeah. there's a lot of different ways to bridge things 
Um, and we anticipate there will be lots of different mechanisms used for different use cases. Um, so I wouldn't say there's a one size fits all answer to that question. But certainly in terms of all the sort of ZK light client bridging stuff that everybody's mm -hmm. doing these days, I think there's a lot of interesting potential applications there that nice. I haven't really delved into the details myself. Last thing, maybe you can give us a little bit of a sense for the timeline, the roadmap. When are you live? Can people already use this? Yeah, where are you at? Right. So as Jeremy said, you know, the current version is open source and the sort of next version we're working on will be open source as soon as it's, um, as soon as it's sort of, you know, more complete. Um, but we are, uh, when you talk about the sort of blockchain and this uh, very fast GPU proving service, we're, we're working on a devnet and we're hoping to have, um, you know, have that be public sometime uh, like early next year, late this year, but we will have a sort of private sign up, um, and we'll we'll be you know sending that out uh, uh, over Twitter probably mostly and <laughs> various other distribution channels. So cool. a couple of people have signed up, and you know we're hoping hoping to get this into ha people's hands you know pretty soon. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Brian and Jeremy, for coming on the show and sharing with us all your work on Risk Zero as well as your journey to work in this field. Yeah, thank you guys. It was super fun, actually. Sorry, I devolved into some weird tangents, but it was kind of. I don't know. I mean, it's the whole point of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tangent <laughs> podcast. All right, thanks again, Guillermo, as well for coming on for this one, all the way thanks from Bogota. Bogota. <gasps> Big fan. I'm very excited to actually, you know, be on it. When we started the company, it was like maybe someday we can be on this. What? <laughs> Today's your day. <laughs> nice. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. I want to say a big thank you to the podcast team, Henrik, Rachel, and Tanya. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Bye.